Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the University of Washington Tacoma, uh, and welcome to the University of Washington uh, University of Writing Program's fourth annual symposium on writing. Tonight um, uh, is uh, is this year's first of two guest speakers. Um, our theme this year is the role of mindfulness and embodiment in writing and assessment. I want to thank everyone for coming to, um, tonight. Um, braving the elements, uh, and thank you to those who also made it to the workshop this this morning. It was a wonderful workshop, very engaging. Is it? Am I not close enough? I'll be, get a little closer. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Ricky. <laughs> okay, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, uh, so th this morning's workshop was very engaging uh, and wonderful, and I learned some things, um, and it took away a couple of practices that I will uh, uh, be using, so I'm glad for that. So thanks, thank you, Donna, for that this morning. So today, our special um, guest speaker is uh, Dr. Donna Strickland. Dr. Donna Strickland is an associate professor of English at the University um, of Missouri, where she teaches courses in writing studies and rhetoric in the English department. She's taught classes and workshops in mindful writing for students and faculty since 2008. Beyond her doctorate in rhetoric and composition, she's also um, a uh, uh, a graduate of the Mindfulness for Educators program at Antioch College in New, of New England, and recently completed an MA in counseling psychology as well. Contemplative and mindfulness practices in academic settings with teachers and students has taken much of Dr. Strickland's time in recent years, but perhaps um, she'll share more of that with us later on tonight um, or this afternoon. But beyond her work there in contemplative and mindfulness uh, practice, with writing and academics, Dr. Strickland has an established history of publishing scholarship in writing studies and writing program administration. She's the author of the Managerial Unconscious um, in Composition Studies, which won the W. Ross Winrod Award in 2011, which is among her uh, among her many um, essays and chapters from on genre uh, or uh, excuse me gender, race, affect um, uh, in the field of composition studies. But beyond her deep experience in the field and wide interests and training in rhetoric and composition, as well as contemplative studies and counseling psychology, there is another reason I'm personally excited about her being with us tonight. I have the pleasure of calling Donna my friend. Um, we met about 10 years ago um, at a symposium at the University of Massachusetts Am in Amherst, where uh, about 12 scholars with different research agendas um, and projects sat around a table for a week and talked about their writing shared some drafts, and then we talked some more. Uh, during that week, Donna led us um, one day through a meditation practice um, for just about five or 10 minutes, as I recall. And it was the first time I'd done such a practice with others that I didn't know, that is, in the company of strangers. Um, we were all from different schools in different parts of the country, um, and that was a very kind of scary but also interesting moment for me. And this ex that experience helped me think about how to use and feel not so scared about using my own meditation practices and my own practices in my private life in my classrooms. So I felt like that was a brave thing for her to do at that moment. And it was a, it, I, it, it engendered me to be able to be brave enough for my students and do it in my classes. And I've been doing it for quite some time now. And I think that I'm a better teacher and my classrooms are better classrooms for it. So. Without any more um, uh, words from me, I will say, everyone, um, please um, help me welcome uh, Dr. Donna Strickland. Thank you, Asal, so much. That was really lovely. Um, yeah, I have such fond memories of that symposium. So what you all also need to know, so every year when it's Asal's birthday, I see it on Facebook, right? It's a Sal Inouye's birthday, and I'm like, I remember the time that Peter Elbow serenaded <laughs> a Sal Inouye on his viola. <laughs> yeah, it was great. <clears throat> All right, so um, I am going to uh, set my meditation timer and so it's going to go off periodically, just so you know. <laughs> it's, it will make sense, I think, as I'm talking. All right, so there's our start. And since we're such a small group, uh, you know, please let me know if there's things that I can clarify, if you have questions. I don't see any reason. Well, I suppose the microphone is a reason. 
<laughs> but I don't really see any reason why we shouldn't just make all of this, you know, fairly collaborative um, as we're going. So uh, feel free. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That sounds good. Okay. Um, so I actually would like us to start with a pause. So just feeling yourself just sitting here, right? Asking yourself the question, how do I actually know that I'm sitting, right? What are the signals that my body's giving me that I'm sitting? Noticing that. And seeing if you can be with those signals, whatever they are from the body, without thinking a lot about them, bringing an attitude of acceptance and kindness to whatever arises. And I'll be asking you to do this periodically throughout the talk. So just being able to tune into the body, right? the sitting position of the body. So here's where I want to go um, today. Uh, this is what my presentation is doing anyway. Um, so I want to talk about why I'm uh, focusing on mindful writing for faculty, right? Um, where I, I see that as my starting place rather than necessarily focusing on my mindful writing for students. I do see this as also being about mindful writing for students, but I want to start with mindful writing for faculty. Um, I'll talk about mindfulness itself um, and then talk about interpersonal mindfulness, a special uh, extension of, of this more traditional kind of isolated mindfulness experience. Um, and as I talk about interpersonal mindfulness, I'm going to be talking about this psychological concept, attachment theory. I want to introduce you to Robert Boyce's method, which is really at the heart of um, the way that I teach mindful writing. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about a workshop I did for faculty uh, in 2016 and a study that I did. This was actually my uh, master's thesis, <laughs> the, the study was. Um, and then... Uh, I want to conclude and, and, and try to begin to talk about, I don't see mindfulness as, um, you know, mindfulness is very popular right now in the West. Uh, and it's often been being incorporated into lots and lots of different places, including, um, uh, you know, corporations, right? Corporations like Monsanto, right, in, in St. Louis. And so it's like, huh? <laughs> right? So, you know, it's not, for me, mindfulness isn't just a way of being better in the world. It's actually a way of making a better world. And so I really want to try to begin to point to that in, in small ways. I don't want to oversell it, but I do think that that's a really important piece for me. Okay. So why mindful writing for faculty? Um, this isn't on a slide, this is just a story I want to tell. And if you were at the workshop this morning, you already heard the story, but not everybody was at the workshop. Um, so uh, at the University of Missouri, where I teach, um, for tenure, we, we need to write a book. I was telling a sow earlier, you know, really that's it. <laughs> I mean, I suppose if you did horrible things in the classroom, they might not give you tenure. I don't know. I mean, I've never seen it happen. You know, I've only seen people not get tenure because they don't have a book. So the book is like this big deal. Um, so as I was on the tenure track, I had a dissertation that I was going to turn into my book. It, you know, people told me, Donna, it's a, it's a really good manuscript. You don't need to do that much work on it. And yet, year after year, it was not getting finished. <laughs> I would sit down in front of the computer, and nothing would happen. <laughs> and I began to hate it so much that I decided I just wasn't going to do it, <laughs> right? I, I decided I was going to just write a different book because I just hated my book so much. I thought the problem was the book, right? Not my, <laughs> my way of, of writing and relating to the book. Um, so I had the good fortune to meet, a, uh, to meet a, somebody who became a good friend um, who was really interested in my work, the work that I was doing on... Um, writing programs uh, and the, the politics of writing programs. Um, she was very interested in it, and so that kind of got me excited about my book again. And she said, hey, I'd like you to be in this writing group, this online writing group that I have. We just commit to writing every day, and we report to each other uh, online. But before you can be in it, you need to read this book by Robert Boyce, How Writers Journey to Comfort and Fluency. Somebody had earlier told me I should read Robert Boyce, and I was like, no, I... No, 
I don't have time <laughs> to read a book about writing, and I'm a writing expert. Why do I need to write, read a book about writing? So I read the book, Robert Boyce's book, How Writers Journey to Comfort and Fluency, and it really changed my life. <laughs> you know, people say this, but it's true. <laughs> uh, and I saw how his method was really in sync with the mindfulness practice that I was already doing, particularly interpersonal mindfulness. Um, and so that's really a lot of what I'm going to share is it comes out of that experience. But so this is why I start with mindful writing for faculty, because I needed to change my own relationship to writing before I could offer that to students. And in fact, did start um, teaching a class for students in mindful writing, but also do these workshops for faculty. So it's very personal for me. It's not abstract. This is something that um, has really had an effect on my life. But I think there are also general reasons that we can perhaps all um, understand why it is important to bring mindfulness to faculty. Um, the first reason is just that, you know, writing brings up a lot of anxiety in people. And we don't really talk about this, <laughs> especially as faculty. I think we just, it, we're just supposed to toughen it up, right, and just go forward. Um, so Robert Boyce, these are, and I'm sorry, my citations are not so great on here. I don't, I don't know what I was doing. I, I, so I was like, like accumulating stuff from different places, and I don't, I don't have consistent citation. But anyway, um, so he says, writing projects acquire aversive, even phobic qualities, while writers grow distressed, even depressed. And here he's talking about you know, professors. I mean, most of his work was with professors. Um, these observations may seem obvious, yet knowledge about writing problems is not common sense. Most of us know little about them beyond our own experiences. Um, and then he says, although the majority of new faculty procrastinate, block, and suffer, the majority of new faculty, this is, he's a psychologist, so he was, a, he was, he was doing studies here. The majority of new faculty block. <laughs> no one notices <laughs> or wants to intervene or talk about it. Okay, um, women and people of color in particular may suffer when social support for writing is low. This is another study, he has, this is, so Boyce was, uh, he, let me tell you a little bit about Robert Boyce. <laughs> uh, Robert Boyce was trained as an experimental psychologist. He actually, his first job I think was actually at the University of Missouri, I of course didn't know him then, but his first job as an experimental psycho psychologist was at University of Missouri. He was, he was publishing along just fine, and so his friends, his colleagues would come to him and say, how do you do this? <laughs> how are you so successful? And so he, he started realizing that not everybody could do what he was doing. And so he started studying what he was doing, right, and, and systematizing it, um, and eventually then moved into faculty development. He, he retrained as a clinical psychologist, started working with people who had writing problems in a, um, in a therapeutic setting, um, but then also did faculty development. So... One of his concerns then, in addition to um, working with faculty on their blocking, was also this issue of how do we retain women and uh, faculty of color, right? And what's going wrong? Like, what would they identify as their problems? And so he did this study and found that, in fact, what a lot of them identified, what a lot of women and faculty of color identified was this lack of support for their work. I and mean, I think we know other reasons, too. Pe pe women and people of color tend to be tapped for more service work. I mean, there are a lot of reasons, but this was one of the reasons, was this lack of social support. Um, <clears throat> reason number three for fo focusing on faculty and mindful writing, pressure from the corporate university. This is, a, a chronicle, this is from a Chronicle of Higher Ed um, article that came out in 2001, and I think you know, that was unbelievably 16 years ago. <laughs> but I think that this is just, pointing towards a problem that has only increased over the years um, as, you know, as uh, the pool, as the pool for, well, no, it's not really, it's really the pool. It's that universities are hiring fewer and fewer faculty and putting less and less resources into teaching. And so the standards for publication have grown and grown and grown in the corporate university. So at Ivy League universities like Columbia, now where you had to write one book, you write two. And even at more teaching-oriented universities like the University of Richmond, there's an expectation for publication that wasn't there before. So there's this new pressure um, to publish. So there's already anxiety around writing, and then there's increased anxiety, right, because of these increased uh, expectations. So more anxiety and less support for professors, more anxiety and less support for students, right? Ah, pause. So just feel yourself sitting. Here you are listening to this. <laughs> so
So um, this is from a study that Dylan Dreyer did, published it in Three C's um, a few years ago. He did a study of new teachers, graduate student teachers, um, and found that graduate student teachers tended to project their own anxieties about academic writing onto their students. They had their own anxiety, and what, you know, what he found is that they had their own anxieties about writing their own issues with academic writing, but they sort of didn't leave any room for their students <laughs> to, to uh, you know, like they might have trouble remembering citations, right? But if their students had trouble remembering citations, it was like they would, they would be in trouble for that, right? And so they weren't realizing that, oh, I have anxiety. My students have anxiety too, right? So they weren't able to do that. Um, and so he says, the adoption and use of academic writing conventions are often fraught experiences throughout the entire breadth and depth of post-secondary and postgraduate populations, and even among English studies graduates, perhaps even among postgraduate faculty across curriculum, perhaps even among you know, English studies people who are going up for tenure and past tenure. <laughs> These are things we don't talk about, right? But they're there. These, it's fraught. It continues to be fraught. Um, OK. So reason number five, attachment theory. So our, does anybody know about attachment theory? OK, so one person. I am just like in love with attachment theory. <laughs> so attachment theory, um, so this goes back to um, uh, uh, a psychoanalyst named John Bowlby in the mid 20th century who came up with this theory, but it's also been, it's been researched and studied. It's very um, important in developmental psychology. It's very important in social psychology. So our felt sense of security in our interpersonal relationships uh, and, and in social situations is based on our earliest and ongoing experiences with attachment figures, our parents, our other caregivers, our teachers, and then later with um, our intimate partners. And, and you know, our early experiences really begin to condition our later experiences. These things can change, um, but they do create these conditions, right? So um, if we have a kind of insecure relationship with our parents early on, that may then create insecure relationships in our relationships, in our intimate relationships later in life, right? Um, but I think that it's important also to know that we can have different attachment relationships to different people and in different situations. Um, and so, you know, I've been thinking about the ways in which um, we can have insecure attachment in school, in schools, and for lots of different reasons, right? So, um, for people who are from marginalized backgrounds, I think that there's an insecure relationship that can happen there, right? And so, there's a kind of trauma really around writing that can happen through that insecure um, relationship because the teacher isn't there for the student. Um, Strain situation is a way of measuring, of not measuring, but uh, assessing um, attachment in um, uh, young children, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. I just think it's so funny that it's called the strain situation, um, and I can tell you about it if you're interested. <laughs> anyway, attachment creates the possibility of mentalization. This is something that a later um, attachment theorist has talked about, Peter Fonagy. Um, and so mental is because when, we're, when we have security in our relationships, we're able to do this reflective thinking, right? Um, we're able to really have a kind of emotional intelligence because we have that sense of security, of internal security. Um, so it allows for metacognition. And mind, what mindfulness creates is meta-awareness, right? So, Mindfulness is kind of like a way of getting attachment or the feeling of attachment without an attachment figure. And I'll say again more about that. But so with all of those things put together, here's my basic argument. Mindfulness itself offers a secure base. As scholars and writers, we can practice mindful writing in order to resist and survive in the often dehumanizing context of the corporate university. And as teachers, we can see more clearly and with more compassion how to model for students, perhaps especially students who bear the insecurities of cultural trauma, a secure relationship with writing, and thus enable them to accomplish their own important work. 
All right, so mindfulness. What is it? It's a buzzword. <laughs> so I'd like to talk a little bit about how I understand mindfulness. This is sort of the basics though, right? <laughs> We want to try to get our body and mind in the same place. <laughs> That's the basics of mindfulness. Usually we're in the past, we're in the future. This is, you know, this is what our brains just do, right? So the brain has this thing called the default network. It's, and often when I talk about this, I sort of point to the middle of my head because it's the medial prefrontal cortex, if you're into that thing, <laughs> into that sort of thing medial prefrontal cortex and some other structures behind it. But that's a, the default network. If we're not thinking about other things, we're in that. And the default network is thinking about the future, thinking about the past. <laughs> that's the default network. So, you know, when you're, pra if, you, if you've tried to practice mindfulness and you, you know, have thought, oh, I can't stop thinking. Well, that's because your, your brain for all of these years, that's what it's been doing. Give it a break. <laughs> be kind to it, right? That's what it's been trained to do. We're just trying to get it to do something else so that we can be more attentive uh, and, and more centered. All right, mindfulness. So this is a, a well-known definition of mindfulness from John Kabat-Zinn. John Kabat-Zinn, you may know, developed um, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a secularized version of, of mindfulness training. Um, he developed it at... Um, the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And he just had this sense that mindfulness would help people. Uh, he was a biologist there uh, at the medical school and wanted to offer mindfulness classes. This was like in the, I don't know, 70s or 80s or something like that. And, uh, you know, he really wasn't getting much support from the medical school, um, but there were people with chronic pain and they didn't know what else to do with them. And so they said, hey, you want to teach these people mindfulness? Why not? And it helped <laughs> people with chronic pain. So that was how John Kevick is then got his start. And now it's like used for everything, right? Every conceivable <laughs> affliction or non-affliction, mindfulness is brought in as an intervention. Anyway, this is his famous um, definition of mindfulness. The awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to things as they are. So just as we've been doing, paying attention in the moment to the sensations of sitting, no need for judgment. It's just how they are, right? It's mindfulness. Oh, that's just a video. I'm not going to show it to you. Um, <laughs> mindfulness is cultivated through formal practices. So we, because our mind isn't trained to do this, we need to train it, right? And so there are lots of different formal practices you can do. Um, the breath awareness is one of the sort of basic ways that mindfulness um, is taught. Um, there's also the body scan, so just kind of going through the body, noticing sensations in the body, walking meditation, awareness of walking, um, and so many other practices. Um, that It's really about, you know, training the mind to look at something on purpose, and there are so many different ways of doing that. Um, also then cultivated through informal pr practices, because ideally we do these formal practices so that our daily life can be affected. Um, and so we can begin to make that transfer from the formal practices uh, into our daily life by sort of intentionally cultivating these informal practices. Uh, yeah, that's a nice quote from John Kabat-Zinn. The, remember, the real meditation is your life and how you inhabit it moment by moment. So you can do all these, you know, mindful eating, mindful driving, mindful waking, mindful noticing thoughts, blah, 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 blah. And mindful writing. Um, so mindfulness cultivates certain attitudes towards experience. This is, this is the way mindfulness gets um, uh, studied, right? So uh, Ruth Baer, who's at the University of Kentucky, uh, she first identified four mindfulness skills that can be measured. Um, she later developed it into five uh, scales, which actually I'll talk about a little later because I used it in my study. But anyway, observing, describing, acting with awareness, um, accepting without judgment are sort of these core mindfulness skills, attitudes. This is, ah, pause. Feel yourself sitting. So this is, um, this chart shows the 
increase in studies on mindfulness. Um, someone at the workshop this morning was mentioning that there was just um, a paper just was published very recently, basically saying that um, it's all rubbish. <laughs> all these <laughs> mindfulness studies really don't show anything. The tr I mean, the truth is, is that there are a lot of mindfulness studies. And so, yeah, there's a lot of rubbish. <laughs> and there, I mean, even this report that she was describing, I mean, if you actually look at it, says, okay, there's pretty good evidence that mindfulness uh, has positive benefits, particularly for anxiety, depression, stress, right? So uh, I think there is quite good research, but it's, it's, it, you can see how it's become the buzzword, right? I mean, look at, so I started teaching <laughs> mindful writing like here, right? 82 studies that year. Now, <laughs> last year there were 667. Wow. So it's huge. But, so that's where it is now. I'd like to go and talk a little bit about the origins of mindfulness. And this is really important for me for a number of reasons. In one, because that's where I really got my start in my, um, studying mindfulness. I mean, it's uh, um, really a spiritual practice for me. But I also really want to uh, point out that it's not a Western way of thinking, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's been heavily... Um, assimilated, um, made to assimilate into the West, but it's not a Western practice. It, it originated in Southeast Asia. Um, and in fact, um, the historical Buddha, who lived 2,500 years ago, um, you know, at the time, and still, right, there's a caste system in India, uh, and there's a word that was used to describe um, people of the upper castes in um, Pali, the language that the Buddhist, uh, the earliest Buddhist um, doc, uh, docu not documents, discourses are written in, um, in that language, the word for these, you know, the people in the higher castes is Arya, which is where Aryan <laughs> comes from. Um, and it means literally noble ones. The Buddha taught that the Arya are not those people who are born into it. The Arya are the people who practice, right? Who practice to actually better themselves. So he was really breaking down the caste system. So I think that's another thing that I really want to emphasize that the Buddha himself was a social justice warrior in many ways. Um, so anyway, two, two really important texts um, uh, around mindfulness, the Satipatthana Sutta, Foundations of Mindfulness, and Anapanasati Sutta, the Mindfulness of In and Out Breathing. So Sati, S-A-T-I, is the word for uh, mindfulness. It can also be translated as ref a reference point or the ability, just the ability to keep something in mind. So I just wanted to offer, you know, what the Buddha, or as best we can determine the Buddha, <laughs> taught. Uh, so this is from the Satipatthana Sutta, the Maha Satipatthana Sutta, the greater Satipatthana Sutta. There's a couple different versions of the Satipatthana Sutta. So what is right mindfulness? There is the case where a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. He remains focused on feelings in and of themselves, the mind in and of itself, mental qualities in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. This is called mindfulness. This is the direct path for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and distress. So the things that I have highlighted there, focused on the body, focused on feelings, um, the mind and mental qualities. Those are the four foundations for mindfulness, for, or the four bases uh, for bringing mindful awareness to bear. So we often talk about the body, right? I mean, that's really the starting point. It's an important starting point. 
There's also then mindfulness of feelings, aware of, it's actually just a bare feeling tone, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Um, mindfulness of our mental states, which actually includes emotions, so it's that way we're thinking about those feelings. Um, also, you know, do we have a lot of anger? Do we have a lot of love? Like, what's the mind like? So mindfulness of that. Mental qualities in and of themselves, that's a translation of the word dhamma, um, which actually can also refer to the Buddhist, Buddha's teaching. So it's kind of, uh, it can mean the Buddhist teachings, it can mean just the way things are, natural law, right? So that's the fourth category. Now, body, feelings, mind. Those are the three things that psychologists talk about, okay? So, <laughs> I mean, contemporary psychologists, if you go to see any therapist, those are the things they're going to look at. They're going to look at your behaviors, they're going to look at your emotions, and they're going to look at your thoughts, right? The Buddha came up with this 2,500 years ago. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I just think that's so cool. Um, and he said, you know, this is the direct path for overcoming sorrow and lamentation 2,500 years ago, right? Pretty cool. Um, and so then mindfulness of breath. So that's, as I said, often a starting point for teaching Western mindfulness in the West. Um, this is the Anapanasati Sutta. I just think this is so cool. So I think it's cool, but I'm not the only person. You know, years ago when I was reading Thich Nhat Hanh, before I knew very much about all this stuff, he said that when he learned that this thing existed, the Anapanasati Sutta, he was so happy. <laughs> it made him so happy. And you can see why it would make him so happy, because it's like explicit instructions in what to do. I mean, this is 2,500 years ago. Here's how you pay attention to your breath 2,500 years ago. Now, how is mindfulness of in and out breathing developed and pursued so as to be of great fruit, of great benefit? There is the case where a monk, having gone to the wilderness, to the shade of a tree or to an empty building, sits down folding his legs crosswise holding his body erect, and setting mindfulness to the fore. Always mindful, he breathes in. Mindful, he breathes out. So let's do that. Let me make sure this isn't going to ring while we're in the middle of it. Uh, I think it's not. Okay, good. So let's just do a little mindfulness of in and out breathing. So with the body erect, Bringing mindfulness to the fore, so that's, you know, just that sense of intentionality. Here we are, mindfully just noticing the breath coming in. So wherever you feel it, at the nostrils or in the abdomen. And mindful as you breathe out, feeling the breath going out. We'll just do this for another minute or so. So just paying attention. If you want the eyes to close, the eyes can close. They don't have to. The mind starts to think, just bring it back gently. Okay. So um, one of the things that I actually wanted to say earlier when I was talking about the default network, this is also something I think is just so cool, is that when we're paying attention to our breath in that way or to our body, um, even if it isn't the breath, we go into a different part of the brain. So, you know, the default network is here, processing the body is the lateral, uh, lateral prefrontal cortex. It actually goes into a different part of the brain and the default network shuts down. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> I just love it. I mean, so this is why it feels so good. It's because we're just, we're, we're saying, hey, be quiet, default network. <laughs> Got something else to do here. Okay. Oh, well, there you go. Do something else now. <laughs> Be with the body. So I want to talk about interpersonal mindfulness because for me this is a really key link between mindfulness as we 
typically think of it as this kind of uh, individual practice. Um, for me, it really bridges into mindful writing and it helped me to make a connection between mindfulness and the writing um, protocols that Robert Boyce had developed. Um, so interpersonal mindfulness um, is really kind of the secular name for a practice called insight dialogue um, that was developed by um, a man named Gregory Kramer who actually lives up in uh, Orcas, on Orcas Island. And um, there's actually you know, a pretty uh, established group of folks in Seattle who practice inside dialogue. So if, you, if this whets your appetite at all <laughs> for interpersonal mindfulness, there, there are people around who are available um, to teach it. Um, I was really interested in, when I first learned about Insight Dialogue, I saw a, a flyer that, and um, it said something about how, um, so, you know, in Buddhism, there are four noble truths. The first noble truth is that there is suffering. Um, and so this flyer said, um, the Buddha taught that there is suffering in life, and much of our suffering is interpersonal in nature. <laughs> and I was like, yes, <laughs> this is right. <laughs> And so I was very motivated <clears throat> to do this practice. And okay, I just said Robert Boyce's book changed my life, so I'm about to say another, say another thing changed my life. But it's true. This really, I just feel like this changed my life so much. As I was saying earlier that he thought of me as a good listener. And I have, a, I mean, people have taught, told me that throughout my life that I'm a good listener. One of the things that I learned through doing Insight Dialogue is that I would really kind of lose myself in listening. And what Insight Dialogue taught me is that I can still be with myself while listening. I can be in my body, I can be embodied, and I can extend that awareness out to include another person, which is huge because you don't want to lose yourself <laughs> when you're listening to another person. Um, you can have all kinds of reactivity going on and you're not even aware of it, so that when you then respond, you're responding out of all of that reactivity, right, rather than out of a sense of compassion and intentionality. So it's taught me a lot. Uh, and this basically says a lot of the stuff that I just said, <laughs> the first noble truth and all that. Um, so there are actually six guidelines in Insight Dialogue, but when it's taught in a secular setting, it's, it's actually now incorporated into um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, interpersonal mindfulness is. So when it's taught in that setting, it's just these three guidelines that are used. And so I want to go over these guidelines. Um, so the first guideline, pause, is really what we've already been doing. You've already been experiencing pause, is just coming back to the body, right? Feeling the body, getting out of that stream of forward momentum that we tend to be in. In insight dialogue, we practice pause when we're with another person in dialogue, right? When we're listening and when we're speaking. Pausing when you're speaking. <laughs> what an interesting concept, right? Because we sort of tend to think, oh, I just got to keep talking. <laughs> but we lose ourselves, right? We lose ourselves in that stream of words. And so what would happen if we pause while we were talking? So pause. Relax, relax is, so as you pause, as you notice the body, often we notice, oh, there's some tension here. <laughs> some tension in the body, there's some tension in the mind. And so as we notice those things, we can invite ease through this instruction, relax. Um, everything doesn't relax immediately. It's conditioned over many, many years. And so part of the guideline relax is also acceptance. Right? Accepting, oh, there's some tension here right now. Can I be kind to myself as this tension arises? I mean, again, just try to think about this interpersonally. Right? Think about all the stuff that happens when we bring two histories together. <laughs> so much reactivity. Can we notice that? How would that change things if we notice the reactivity that's arising as we encounter another person, maybe a person who's quite different from us, right? Can we notice that reactivity? And can we be kind and try to sort of temper it? Open, 
um, speaks to what I, is, is really the instruction that speaks to what I was um, sharing earlier about realizing that I left myself, you know, all my attention was with the other person. Open is that groundedness in the body that we have through pause and just extending that awareness out to include another person. Sometimes the awareness is gonna kind of move. Maybe a little more of it's gonna be with the person out there listening. Maybe it's gonna be a little more here. But the basic idea is that I wanna hold both. I wanna have room for both. I wanna know what you're saying. I wanna see you as I'm speaking to you. And I also wanna be aware of my reactivity. Not just when I'm listening, but also when I'm speaking. I wanna be able to open to you as, as the listener. Right, as I'm speaking. So those are the interpersonal mindfulness guidelines. So <clears throat> now I think I wanna talk about, yes, I do. I wanna talk about attachment. So why am I talking about attachment in relationship to interpersonal mindfulness? So there, um, Dan Siegel, he's written a number of books, Mindful Brain, um, uh, yeah, The Mindful Brain is sort of one of the big ones. He has this, this idea that, um, or not an idea, I mean, it's based on research. Um, but basically that um, mindfulness creates this felt sense of attachment, right? And that we can sort of earn attachment through practicing mindfulness. Um, there's a psychologist who sort of took up that idea and wrote a book about attachment and psychotherapy. And he feels that the therapeutic relationship is a way of creating um, secure attachment as well. Other people think this, it's not just him. But that mindfulness, the therapist's own mindfulness, is a way of kind of modeling secure attachment for, uh, for the client, for the patient. Um, and when I read that book, it clicked for me that this is why Inside Dialogue, Interpersonal Mindfulness is so powerful, because it repairs attachment. I mean, that's what's happening it creates a possibility of secure attachment because I am stable in my body, pausing, opening out to another. That's what secure attachment is. <laughs> secure attachment is that felt sense of I'm safe, I'm okay over here. And because I am safe over here, I can have compassion and empathy for you because I don't need to protect myself. I'm safe. So interpersonal mindfulness creates this sense of a secure base that comes from attachment. Um, character, I thought this was a, a pretty interesting chart, characteristics of secure attachment, especially the adults, um, and especially the part about uh, three and four, comfortable sharing feelings with friends and partners and seeking out social support. When you're not securely attached, you think you have to do it all yourself. <laughs> How many students and how many of us think that we can't seek help in our writing, right? Because there's a lack of secure attachment around writing. Does this, is this making sense, right? There's a lack of secure attachment. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'll just, I'm, I'm just being totally honest here, right? Part of my distress around writing was that I did think I had to do it all myself. So one of the big things that changed, so I was in that group, right? She invited me to be in that email group, as I was telling you. I started writing just with other people. So, it, you know, meeting with friends and writing. And then I was also in um, a writing group where we shared each other's writing. I mean, I joined three writing groups. <laughs> all different, for all different, I mean, all different aspects of writing. This is huge, right? And it's because of that realization, oh, I'm okay over here. I can ask for help and I need it, right? I need that support. Uh, oh, okay, so this is the guy who, has, this is the psychologist, David Wallen. Um, so this is a nice quote. A mindful stance allows us to be more fully present. Ah, be more fully present right now. <laughs> A mindful stance allows us to be more fully present, open, and capable of responding, like the good enough attuned parent. This is a concept from 
actually pre-attachment theory, but the good enough parent. Like the good enough attuned parent to the requirements of the moment as these emerge in our interactions. That makes me think of what you were saying earlier, Asao, about the chaotic classroom, right? Being able to respond to the requirements of the moment. Second, a mindful and present-centered stance fosters an experience of being inside, aware of the body. The resulting attunement to our own somatic responses amplifies the signals that allow us to tune into the nonverbal expressions of another person's. And I would say this holds true for writing too, right? I mean, we want to be able to sense into what's going on for us so that we can kind of imagine our audience, right? In a, and not in a fearful way, in a compassionate way, right? In a caring way. Um, mindfulness can potentially enhance accurate empathy as well as our ability to connect with another person's experience. Third, mindfulness like a secure state of mind with respect to attachment, fosters an attitude of acceptance, a non-defensive openness and receptivity to experience as it is. So again, you know, thinking about our writing experience, right? We want to be able to accept the ups and downs of writing. I mean, this is another problem, right? When you sit, I mean, so what I was doing before, right? Sitting down, not being able to write, oh, I mean, this, this makes me think I'm terrible at writing, even though there might be another day when it's fine, right? So being able to be with ups and downs of writing is a really important part of uh, moving into a more mindful state with, uh, in respect to writing. Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about what Boyce's method is. These are some of Boyce's books. Um, and the, how writer's journey to comfort and fluency is um, the one that really... Uh, has been so meaningful to me. I wanted to tell you something about that, though. Um, I was giving a, just a little, not much of a presentation, a little tiny presentation to a small group of faculty who were interested in mindfulness. And I was talking about this book and um, how writers journey to comfort and fluency. And this uh, faculty member said, no, wait, what's the name of that book? How writers journey from, com let's see, what did he say? A writer's journey from comfort to fluency? <laughs> How a writer's journey from comfort to fluency, get it? <laughs> so there's this perception that we shouldn't be comfortable, <laughs> right? And this is what uh, Boyce is all about, is that actually you want to be comfortable when you're writing. This is what allows us to do the hard stuff, right? Is that when we're, we have that sense of comfort, we can do the hard stuff that we need to do in our writing. Okay, so some of Boyce's key insights. Um, there's a tendency we have, there's a kind of tendency among academics, maybe among, I don't know, other people too, to binge write, leading to cycles of what he calls hypomania and exhaustion. And I was talking earlier today about how I think we're really acculturated into that, right? Through the semester system, we tend to have longer projects at the end of the semester tend to put them off, <laughs> and so we have a couple of nights where we, you know, stay up late, do all the writing, feels really exciting, <laughs> everything's charging up, and so we begin to think, oh my goodness, this is how I work. I work best under pressure. Look at me coming up with all these exciting ideas. Boyce did these great studies in which he compared people who did that to people who, who used his method, which is to write a little bit every day. Who do you think was more creative and more productive? People who wrote a little bit every day, <laughs> right? Not the people who felt like, oh, whoo, <laughs> I'm so creative. Okay. Um, aversion to writing results from exhaustion and writing with discomfort, right? So we, we build up all of this aversion because we're writing in these binges. Impatience gets in the way of writing because we, it's like me sitting in front of my computer thinking that something was going to happen. I just wanted it to happen, right? <laughs> Impatience gets in the way. Um, Reflecting on our writing and planfulness help, writer, help writers toward fluency. Boyce, I should say, I, I don't think I said this, I think I said this this morning, but um, in this book, he doesn't really talk about mindfulness much. Actually, in a later book, he does label what he's doing mindfulness. But in this book, he didn't. And, but it was things like this that made me think, this is like mindfulness, right? This intentionality, this is like mindfulness. Um, Writing daily counters binging and establishes writing as one of many moderately important parts of life. I think this is such a cool part of uh, Boyce's work. He has this part in his book where he says, you know, writing should just be something we do every day, no more important than other things. 
which is also not something that we're acculturated to, I think, right? I mean, it's like, writing is everything. <laughs> well, yeah, it's important. So is, you know, exercising. <laughs> so is having a family, right? These are all important things. Um, paying attention to our bodies as we write allows us to bring comfort and ease to writing. So we tend to, you know, I don't know how many of you know Ken, um, uh, what's his name? The, the person who had that TED talk that a lot of people listen to, Ken Robinson, Robinson thank you. Yes, yeah, Sir Ken Robinson, <laughs> right? Sir Ken Robinson says that um, once we're out of kindergarten, basically it's like we don't have bodies <laughs> in education. <laughs> we're just educated from the neck up, right? Well, you know, we are bodies. And in fact, writing is a pretty much a fully embodied activity. And so bringing attention to it really kind of help, helps to transform the way that we interact with it. I was saying earlier today, I have a lot of students in the journalism school, which is a very competitive school uh, at the University of Missouri. And you know, my students uh, who are in journalism will say, you know, I can't get up. I have to just sit there. And I, I don't go to the bathroom. I don't do it. You know, it's like, pay attention to your body, right? Why do we do this? Why do we, why do we think that we have to sit down and stick, you know, be stuck, be stuck to our chairs like Emily and I were earlier today, <laughs> to be stuck to our chairs? We don't need to be stuck to our chairs. We need to take care of ourselves. Um, okay, so some of Boyce's interventions, he has, he has like lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of guidelines in his book, which he narrowed down to just a few things because he realized it was too many <laughs> things. And this is basically what he, he, um, he narrowed it down to. The first guideline is weight. And that word carries with it that sense of needing for, the need for patience, right? It also carries with it the need to prepare ourselves. We don't just sit down in front of the computer and expect things to happen. We need to wait for that moment, right? By, being, by preparing ourselves, you know, doing research, et cetera. But we also need to begin before we feel ready. So we need to wait, but we also need to, need to take that leap of faith and start, right? Working in brief daily sessions helps to counter the binging. It also is much more comfortable than binging to the body. It's better for the body. Stop. So when you set out to write for an hour, you stop after an hour, even if it feels good. Why? Because you don't want to binge. <laughs> you don't want to get into that cycle of binging. Um, balance preliminaries with writing. So I, Supplement, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I just wanted you to have them. I really want to kind of focus on those first few because I don't, because actually, well, I don't know. I guess I could just talk forever, but <laughs> I probably should not. So I want to focus just on those first few. So uh, I just want to point out how weight, Boise's first guideline weight is a lot like the pause, right? The pause from insight dialogue or interpersonal mindfulness. It's that invitation to step out of the stream of worry, of forward momentum, right? And to ask yourself, what do I actually need? What's actually, um, where am I in my writing? What do I need to do to prepare myself for really sitting down and writing? Uh, the second guideline, begin before feeling ready. Um, we need to be relaxed. We really need to practice with relax in order to do that, right? Because part of the reason we don't start is because there's so much anxiety. And so sometimes procrastinating can seem like such a good alternative <laughs> to having to deal with that anxiety. And so if we can practice with the relax, which is the second guideline in Insight Dialogue, we uh, have a lot better chance of being able to, to take that leap of faith. Um, and we also practice open every time we sit down to write. We want to stay grounded in the body while also making space uh, for the practice of writing. We need that secure base um, and from that to open out to engage with our own thoughts and the possibility of others. So pausing. By now you know what to do. So the third guideline, writing for short periods of day, I, I sort of already talked about this, but just like mindfulness is a practice, something you need to do every day 
because you're retraining the brain, writing is also something you need to do a little bit every day. You're kind of retraining yourself if you've been in this kind of binge cycle. Um, okay, my study. Let me just tell you a little bit about this. Here's my empirical evidence. This was not a great study. It was not a gold standard study, let me tell you. <laughs> I did not have a wait list. I did not have a control group. Oh well, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you about it anyway. <laughs> uh, so Boyce's book, How Writers Journey to Comfort and Fluency, was based upon a year long group that he did. He would, I mean, he repeated many times. So it was a year long. So. Might or shorter intervention also had positive effects was one of my questions, right? So my intervention was just six weeks, not a year. Um, mindfulness training has a record of positive benefits after six to eight weeks. Um, so, that, so mine was six weeks. Um, the mindful writing workshop is shorter and integrates formal mindfulness practice with a modified version of Boyce's year-long cognitive behavioral approach. And his approach is based in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and I added the formal, I've added the formal mindfulness pieces. So if you were at my workshop, you know that we do yoga and we also do formal uh, mindfulness practice and we practice with those three interpersonal mindfulness guidelines so that we're opening, we're including our writing in our mindfulness practice. Uh, so my sample and for, uh, so actually this is interesting, although it's not the sample I wanted. <laughs> I wanted a sample of newer and more diverse faculty that's not what I got, but these are these are people you know who've been teaching on average twelve point six years, so these are experienced faculty who have a lot of writing problems. So I mean, going back to the ubiquity of this, right? Um, so this is the five facet mindfulness questionnaire that I used. We did pre and post. Um, the post was done a month after the workshop ended. Um, these are the things that are looked at, these are some example items, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, writing block questionnaire, this is, Boy this is Boyce's questionnaire, so these are the things that I looked at for that, work apprehension, procrastination, learning apprehension, dysphoria, impatience, perfections, and rigid rules. Again, pre and post, post a month after the workshop ended. Also did open-ended questions, how many days did you write, uh, how long did you write, how did you feel, uh, okay. Results, wow, mindfulness really increased. Look, I took statistics and so I can, <laughs> I have statistics in my, but this is, these are really good. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> so this is, this is the, um, you know, statistical significance. So if it's um, below 0.05, right, that's good. Or, and if it's below 0.01, that's really, really super good. So, uh, you know, this is overall mindfulness. That's super good <laughs> right there. There was a real increase in mindfulness skills at um, a month after the workshop ended. So that's pretty cool. Uh, reductions in blocking tendencies, also good, not as good as the mindfulness. <laughs> but especially with writing apprehension, a decrease in writing apprehension and a it decrease in dysphoria, right? Negative feelings around writing. So, I mean, there is a, a few of the others are statistically significant too. Some of them are not, but. Um, so these are some of the responses related to writing apprehension. Um, a lot of talk about feeling relaxed, more calm, less anxiety. Um, I included one that had, you know, that didn't work so well just to show that <laughs> this is what happens in studies. Not everything is perfect, right? Uh, but there's a lot of calm, a lot of focus, a lot of comfort, less stress. Um, even when I wasn't writing, I did realize that I could calm air and thoughts, so taking it into their life, which is pretty nice. Uh, responses related to dysphoria, so feeling more compassion for the self, less hard on myself. Um, Positive feelings about new ways of being productive, not scared of not getting writing projects done. More writing sessions that are, remember these are like seasoned people, right? Mid-career people. Optimistic, happy, productive. I've been struggling with some generally depressed moods, but I still managed to write, that's pretty cool. Um, 
feel much more confident. Okay, so conclusions seems to have led to a decrease in many factors related to blocking, especially writing apprehension and writing dysphoria, increase in mindfulness skills. Um, so mindfulness, may, you know, there may be a correlation there. Um, I didn't measure the correlations, but this is what mindfulness, this is what the good studies on mindfulness show, is that it helps with anxiety and it helps with depression. <laughs> so it makes sense that these are the things that would have um, improved, right? Um, okay, and those are some problems with it, as I sort of mentioned earlier. Okay, so to wrap up. If faculty become uh, more mindful of writing, they can pr provide a secure base for mindful writing students. Uh, potential ramifications, more secure writers, faculty and students are more compassionate writers. More secure writers mean more people, means more people from more diverse backgrounds will be writing. Uh, more people from more diverse backgrounds means breaking down social barriers and greater democratization. So back to my thesis. <laughs> Mindfulness itself offers a secure base. As scholars and writers, we can practice mindful writing in order to resist and survive in the often dehumanizing context of the corporate university. And as teachers, we can see more clearly and with more compassion how to model for students. Perhaps especially students who bear the insecurities of cultural trauma or secure relationship with writing and thus enable them to accomplish their own important work. So I hope that this thesis maybe has a little more meat behind it now that you're meeting it again the second time. And with that, I will stop. <laughs> One of Boyce's instructions, stop. <laughs> and I would welcome your questions and comments. Does this work? Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Ricky Thompson. I teach rhetoric comp here, rhetoric composition, if you're not or one of those people. Um, I got there, I got a lot of stuff. Um, I've been coming at this from a little bit of a different angle and I can see now kind of a different connection. So I've been looking at things around metacognition and reflection and helping students to try to um, get, a, get a better sense of thinking about their own thinking, uh -huh. including their own uh, negative self-talk around writing um, and how they get in their own way when they're stressed out, right? Uh -huh. And so I also look at, I use like labor logs or I don't always call them that um, to help them see that they're productive in ways that they don't see themselves as productive, yeah. for example. Like the time you spend looking for articles is part of your research time, right? It yes. doesn't mean you didn't write, right? So yes. part of that is um, about also reframing what we count as writing yeah. and being productive. Yeah member of society, which is another thing. I realize as we're talking about this and as we're thinking about, okay, what does mindfulness do? I realize it, you were saying that this is about teaching mindfulness, but I think really what I hear you saying is it's not about teaching mindfulness exactly. I mean, that's the thing you're doing, but it's about decreasing anxiety and depression that gets in the way of engaging in life in meaningful ways around writing, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Would that sound partly kind of what's really, one is the end of the other. And I'll, I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. Okay, go ahead. There's yeah. an assumption that um, when we talk about being calm is a good thing, uh -huh. that everybody, one, gets that inside their body. Uh -huh. But people who struggle with anxiety and depression, yes. as you know, you are a psychologist, if their norm is always is living in a state of anxiety and they're body being at a hyper-elevated state anyways, that norm, uh, they're not at a norm that is calm. So right. that calm often feels scary. Yes, or that's right. Or it feels boring. Yeah, that's Or non-productive. Right. That's right. So this thing about binge writing, I mm -hmm. realized the thing about binge writing, because I heard the whole like write, every, write for 15 minutes for years, and I was like, that, that doesn't work for me. It doesn't work. I, I did that for a long <laughs> time. But I know why now, because I started doing noticing work first, uh -huh. which is really mindfulness work. And what happened was it, it helped me, it was the first time that I saw that I was really anxious. Yes. And so, and it was the first time that I realized there was a good feeling in 
what is considered calm. Yes. And so hypomania, this hypomaniac writing, if you, if your experience your whole life, especially for people who come from like traumatic yeah. homes, yeah. right, in, which a lot of our students do, yeah. if you live in that state of hyper arousal, mm-hmm. then you feel most productive and you feel good. It is yes. a high right. to be in that, in that state, Absolutely. right? So to convince somebody to get off the drug, <laughs> right, of binge yeah. writing is first they have to actually be motivated to feel it in a different way. So there's, so I, I'm finding myself thinking about all these things, like how, how do we get to that, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think part of that is also helping writers and students, all of us, recognize that the hypomania, then there's also the, the hypo and the hypermania, right? That the binge writing, as you say, the other side of that is the non-productive slump where people get very depressed, yeah. which is anxiety, depression cycles, right? right? So it's still around mental health, <laughs> right, yeah. in some way. Yeah. And so I, I guess as I'm coming from it from a different angle, there's a piece of it that that I think for people who haven't gotten to the calm is good yet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Um, and to get to that, I'm not sure how to bridge that yet. Yeah. Um, I'm still trying to figure that out. But I think it's another way that these things connect. And yeah. I, I'm thinking the attachment stuff is another way. But I'll think a little bit more about mm-hmm. where that goes. Maybe it's that the pause is about noticing. Uh-huh. I can see how it works, especially for people who are anxious, right? Because it stops, it turns off that amygdala and the, yeah. the fight or flight brain that starts happening when somebody's anxious to go, oh, I'm safe, so that you can actually focus and take things in. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm talking really fast if you don't know this stuff already. So I apologize. Um, I'm excited. <laughs> a little hypermanic me. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll let it go for that for now because I'm seeing a lot of connections that are exciting and I'm, I'm curious how... I'm curious, where does, yeah. does that help your work in a way, or is there a response to that, or yeah. is, does it go somewhere different for you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. No, I think that all makes sense to me. And, um, you know, the thing about um, sort of convincing people that calm is good, um, I mean, I just, from well, two things. This is why I, th- I think it's important to start with faculty, because I think that as faculty, we need to feel it ourselves. We can't teach it if we don't get it. <laughs> we can't model it. We can't be a secure attachment figure if we don't have that sense of secure attachment in our own bodies. So that's one thing. We provide a model. And then the second thing is that it's all about experience. And so that's, you know, that's why more and more, I haven't even written about this very much because I, what I really like is doing workshops because I feel like you need to do it and you need to feel it. And I think the students need to do it and feel it. Um, not just for me to tell it to them, you know, but for them to actually have lots of space and time to try it out. And I can tell you, I've taught this class for almost 10 years and, uh, You know, and I always have some students who don't, they're like, nope, don't want to be calm. (laughs) You know, a couple, (laughs) a couple. But by and large, by the end of the semester, they're like, whoa, I didn't know that it was possible to write well and not be stressed out. I had no idea. And it feels good. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks. We should should talk talk more. more. Yeah. (laughs) Other questions? Hi, thanks for your talk. I'm Cassie Mira. Um, I remember when I was finishing my dissertation at the University of Michigan, I went to go see a counselor, he was a psychologist, who focused on working with graduate students to talk about writing and workplace habits. And he talked to me about mindfulness and breathing and recommended the Cabot Zen book. And I think at the time I was pretty frustrated with that advice because it's not what I expected going in for the appointment. Um, Like my expectation was really, I want more pages faster. Like Uh that was my kind of impatient feeling. Um, And like I've kind of come back to his advice um, more recently. But I'm wondering just how mindfulness changes when you engage it for a particular purpose. So um, it could be writing other forms of productivity. I've talked, I've heard about mindfulness for weight loss or 
um, for the reduction of stress and anxiety mm -hmm. or um, I know Google has meditation right. rooms. So like how does the practice change when it's not a lifestyle practice or yeah. a spiritual practice and it's kind of about yeah. a particular task? Well, yeah, that's a good question and it's something that really concerns me and that's why I spent some time talking about the origins of mindfulness because I feel like <clears throat> It does change when it becomes just a kind, another way of, of doing what we're already doing, of just supporting the capitalist system, right? It makes me very uncomfortable. Um, so Matthew, or not Matthew, but Mathieu Ricard, who um, uh, is a French Tibetan, or French monk in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, <laughs> um, he recently wrote a piece where he talked about the phenomena of mindfulness to support the patriarchy and capitalism, right? I mean, that whole phenomena. And he said, you know, what's missing is really the ground, the, the, uh, the underpinning of Buddhist philosophy, which is ethics. Um, and, uh, you know, at, this, at the base of ethics, of Buddhist ethics is generosity and non-harming, right? Um, and so I, I feel like it's really easy to lose those things when we, when we apply it to productivity, when we apply mindfulness to productivity. For me, it doesn't feel that way, and that's why I brought in the social justice piece. I realize it's not fully developed, but for me, I just have a felt sense of it as a social justice practice when you keep in mind those ideas, those underlying ideas of generosity and non-harming. Because it's about non-harming the self and it's about you know, not engaging with others in a harmful way. I don't think the same can be said for Monsanto. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, does that answer? Yeah. So for me, it really makes me happy that you know, there were participants in my study who maybe were meeting mindfulness for the first time, and yes, they were applying it to their writing, but they were also taking it into their life. Um, because I don't want it to just be this targeted practice. I really want it to be a life practice. Yeah. So I have a, I just didn't want to, I was trying to fill the gap, but I. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Mary Fox. I teach over at Tacoma Community College. I teach writing. Um, and so I, had, I was really struck by um, the term accurate empathy um, in one of your slides. Because mm. um, I've uh -huh. never seen accurate. I mean, uh -huh, I've never seen <laughs> those two words together. And uh -huh. I think it's really important for a teacher uh -huh. to be cognizant of, of you know, of what we're doing with our students and whether it's we're accurately reading them yes. and et cetera. Yes. Um, and that also brings me, I was thinking then as people were talking, um, you know, mindful in, in my classroom at TCC, and I'm sure it's very um, similar to UWT, um, we have a lot of students who are um, stressed for very, at very different levels for different reasons. Yeah. A lot of veterans, uh -huh. as well as homelessness, yeah. domestic violence, running start students. Um, so for me, um, you know, I, I'm not sure how to, how to um, exist in a classroom where all of those levels of trauma mm -hmm. that I don't understand, mm -hmm. some are diagnosed and I have no business, right. you know, doing anything other than not harming them and yeah. helping them move forward and others where I can make a difference. I'm really not sure, I guess, how do you... How does mindfulness exist with a novice teacher who is, that's not my thing, mm -hmm. but I understand mm -hmm. the value. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm, you know, I want to make sure at the minimum I'm not harming students, right. but raising the bar a little bit so mm -hmm. that um, even those that are, again, I'm thinking of veterans especially, mm -hmm. who have very severe trauma, mm -hmm. um, are also able to move forward or... Yeah when I really don't understand, right. and I, can, I never will understand what they can ever yeah. be going through. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so, yeah. So uh, is your question, a, I think that I, I'm hearing your question. Of, well, <laughs> all right, well, I'll tell you what I think it is. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds like it's something about how do I, 
you know, ha is it appropriate to bring mindfulness into the classroom when I have, when there's this, this level of, yeah, different levels of psychological distress? Yes. And that's, I think, a very, very, very important question to ask. Absolutely. Um, because as mindfulness has become more popular and it's, as it's been sort of just like, oh, hey, let's do a little mindfulness, right? Um, and that's ignored the fact that people are going to have different responses, like asking people to actually get in touch with their feelings when they have trauma or even in touch with their bodies when they have trauma. That's not good, <laughs> right? I mean, sure, it's good done right. But when somebody's just like, woohoo, I'm on the mindfulness train, let's all do mindfulness. Not good. So as Asal mentioned, I did this mindfulness for educators program that was co-sponsored. It was sort of the official degree is from Antioch, um, but um, it was co-sponsored by the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, and that's where we did our work. But mindfulness for educators, it was not about bringing mindfulness into the classroom. It was about mindfulness for educators. <laughs> And that's what I really, that's why I'm focusing on faculty. Because I think before you can bring it into the classroom, you got to do it yourself. And that matters. That's why, that's why the attachment theory piece, I think, is so important. If we can model that, we're making a difference. We're bringing it into the classroom, even if we don't ask our students to meditate. I mean, I happen to ask my students to meditate, but it's also a class called Mindful Writing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, sort of. I mean, actually, I asked them, do you know what this class is called? Two people do. <laughs> but anyway, um, but that's, I mean, that's what I think, right? I mean, because if you, so, you know, that quote about accurate empathy is, is like talking to the psychologist working with, you know, working with a patient. As a psychologist, you need to have that. And so you need to be able to embody it. So it's not about, oh, here as a psychologist, let me, let me, you know, teach you mindfulness, even though psychologists are doing that all the time now, which also kind of drives me a little crazy because sometimes they don't know what they're doing. But, <laughs> but it's about your own mindfulness, and that make, that's make a, making a difference, right? So does that respond to your concern? Yeah. I have a question. Can I ask? Um, I, one thing that I really uh, appreciate about what you've offered us to um, this afternoon is the attachment theory. Like I, I've just not known about that. It helps, really helps me put a word or a set of theories that I can go look up or maybe share with my students about the way I've either uh, talked about in my writing classes with students about with the, my words were um, that the biggest problem that I've seen over the years with students, especially um, uh, uh, first and second year students, for instance, is and really, it's not just them. It's, it's really, it, as you're suggesting, or you're showing, and it's everyone, really, or most folks, is confidence. Yeah. You, if, you don't, if you don't feel confident in, in the act of writing, yeah. I'm not even about a draft. I'm just talking about confident sitting down and writing. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to have a very hard time doing things that are going to be asked of you in, in classes like this. So how do we build confidence? So I'm wondering, um, attachment theory and, and thinking about that seems like it would give me some ways to think about, as you probably know, things that I do around labor-based grading contracts. Uh -huh. that it gives me a way to understand what, how that is changing that, that um, ecology in the classroom uh -huh. so that there isn't a sense of um, anxiety, at least the typical kinds of anxieties about right. graded writing right. and that kind. So I'm wondering if you can talk about whether you, if you see any of that, or if you, or what you, how, what do you think about um, confidence as a surrogate or as one aspect of this attachment? I mean, I just, I'm not sure how to, I'm, again, I'm just contacting this attachment yeah. there for yeah, the first yeah. time. So yeah. I want you to talk maybe a little bit more about how that, how we might, and again, I realize that this is, you don't just, like you said, you don't, you're not just bringing it into the classroom, but, but, um, but I, I feel I, I'm, I'm ready to do that because <laughs> I've done this stuff all, yeah, all right for a long yeah, time. Yeah. So I'm more curious, yeah. like, but, but I don't know, the, but I don't have that language attachment theory yet yeah. until now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's very much about confidence, and um, you know, as I was uh, mentioning, right, with attach, when we have secure attachment, we are able to reach out to others, right. Um, and when we don't have secure attachment, it's just all about, let's, let me protect myself. 
I mean, you can see that in student writing all the time, right? I don't want to risk everything. Just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do, right? I mean, we hear that because I can't reach out. I can't go beyond this. I just want to know what to do. Um, and they, and you know, and so there's a relationship that they have to their writing. Writing is is relational, right? It's not, it's it's not this thing we do in isolation. It's um, relational. So, so if if there's a lack of confidence because of a lack of a, a sense of security, both in relationship to writing, but also often just bigger than that, right? Because of their own histories. Um, I mean, how do you get beyond that? <laughs> you can say, be confident. That's not going to do it, right? I mean, it's an embodied thing. It's an embodied thing. Um, so with grading contracts, like, you know, I mean, I think that that's a, um, I, can, I think that can be a useful way of taking away some of the perf performance anxiety, right? And so sort of um, offering a different way of relating to writing, right? So you don't have to worry about the performance, just do it, right? Um, I think that that can be a useful piece of this whole thing, but again, I think it's the embodiment, right? Hi, Ricky again. I wanna piggyback on that yeah. because I've been trying to kind of make sense yeah. of where the attachment stuff fits and I can see how it fits. So I'm thinking about like when you're, when you're in your secure attached space, if you, it's usually around, there's quadrants, right? So a person who's in a secure space, they are able to also deal with challenge and conflict without mm -hmm. freaking out. Mm -hmm. That's kind of one of the yeah. things, right? Yeah. The reaching out. So they're able to say, oh, I need help. Yes. And they're not afraid to ask for help yeah. because they're not afraid asking for help means the world's going to fall apart, right. all this other stuff. So to not be secure attached, you're generally either fearful um, or anxious, they call it, or avoidant. So you can imagine the opposite of being secure is, I'm avoidant, I'm going to freak out and not do my homework. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to be mm -hmm. fearful and anxious and I'm going to overthink it and, oh mm -hmm. my God, i got to make sure I have enough written and they're going to send you 10 million emails if I'm doing it right. <laughs> so your perfectionist yeah. student is more often on the anxious side yeah. and the one that checks out is, would be on the avoidant. Yeah. So if you kind of look at, and the one who's secure is like, okay, this is hard, I'm struggling, but I'm still okay, I'm not going to check out. So to me, making writing, a write, the writing activity in the whole space as a place that means that it's safe to not check out, yeah. that changes it in yeah. a way, right? So, yeah. which is why I then think about it in terms of, right, then it becomes an anxiety kind of thing. So I, I keep thinking about it in terms of stress hormones, right? Uh -huh. That the minute, the minute a student gets too overwhelmed and they might have been secure in other places of their life, right. but if writing's a space they're not secure, right. then they might go to one of those insecure um, quadrants. And, but if the partner that they're working with, being their teacher yes. or their writing group, um, especially for peers in writing group who are uh, faculty, if they have safe people that they can, that they can say, I'm freaking out to, um, I, I see a faculty here in the room who I do that with, Michelle Garner in social work. I go, I'm freaking out. And she goes, no, this is manageable. Right? You have that talk with a person who's safe that helps you feel centered and grounded. So I think part of the work you're saying you're doing with faculty yeah. is to help them learn to model that better, right? It, yeah. So that they're not putting their own stress about, I'm yes. not getting my research done, and oh my God, yes. and then they come to class and their students feel their yes. stress too. So if you feel secure and safe in your own writing identity... Yes your students are probably going to sense that in a way that they still feel a little more safe to talk to you, yeah. um, come to you, and, and maybe even if you have groups in your classes where there's a safe... So it's really, mm -hmm. in multiple ways, trying to create, I'd say, um, a network of people who allow... That's right. Right, because That's you're right. secure. The earned attachment thing is that you can get more secure by your inter interactions with others who are more secure than you. Yeah. So yeah. even if you started out as anxious... If I'm working, if we're working together and she's totally secure, I'm going to get more and more secure through my interactions. Yes. So you still can get better if you create mm -hmm. more of those spaces, which I think labor lock does. Yeah. By making it non-perfectionist as one yeah. way. Yes, exactly. So. Thank you.
I don't need that. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. That that was so well said. I Absolutely. Been thinking about projects yeah. This, so this just kind of yeah. Gel, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Ron Schwartz from Pierce College. I'd like to ask gentle, this gentleman right here, can you explain a little bit about labor-based uh, uh, contracts or grading contracts in your course? Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, did I have that correct? The, okay, uh, could you tell, explain a bit more about labor-based contracts for grading? I believe that's what you meant to call them. <laughs> oh, okay. Labor based grading contracts are essentially uh, uh, a, a way to take um, the, the worry about grades on every assignment, uh. you know, like, like my standard or some standard, and instead shift that calculating of the course grade to labor, purely about how much effort you put in the task. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is, and there's quality of that, so called quality, is discussion, so work on, but it's not going to be the basis of your I see. Mm -hmm. So progress in the class is separate from progress in learning class, which has always been the case. It's just we've smashed it forever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So this is Jacob Martins, and I teach writing studies, first year writing. And this quarter, uh, we're reading Enrique's Journey which is about a Honduran boy whose mother immigrates to the United States and then creates this 10-year uh, void where the boy just wants to be with his mother. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that broken attachment. Yeah, yeah. And I was just thinking about the connection that uh, when he finally reunites with his mother, it doesn't go so well. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking about... Uh, our students who start perhaps attaching with us mm. and or with someone who's practicing mindfulness and then say something like, where have you been all my life? Mm. And how does that, or do you have that experience where you, you have students who have finished your coursework and then are still attached to you and keep coming back years and years later? Um. Well, I have, I mean, I, I have students who come back uh, years later sometimes, but it usually feels pretty healthy. <laughs> Not unhealthy. <laughs> I hope that means that they're securely attached because that's what secure attachment creates is the ability to separate. I mean, um, so in the strange situation that I referred to, the way that they um, assess a, a a toddler or, or even a or even younger um, child's attachment um, at that time uh, is a mo usually a mother, but a caregiver and a child comes into this this room, right? And there's toys and stuff, um, and uh, and so the child you know goes down and is playing, and then the the, the caretaker is is asked to leave the room, and uh, and then a stranger comes in, and so they watch to see what the child does in relation to the stranger. Do, do they ignore the stranger? Do they get over-interested in the stranger? You know what happens. And then the stranger leaves, and then the mother comes back. And that's the really crucial part, what happens when the mother comes back. So if uh, the child, well, and also when the mother leaves, the stranger comes, if a child isn't securely attached, it tends it tends to either create a lot of anxiety, oh my goodness, my mother's gone, and that's the anxious attachment, or like, ho oh, hum, <laughs> mom's gone, <laughs> gonna keep playing. And then even when mother comes back, if the child has this avoidant attachment, it's like, eh, mom's back, you know, who cares, right? Don't engage. The anxious child goes to mother and is like, well, <laughs> how could you leave me, right? The securely attached child sees mother's there, is happy. Hi, mom, goes over, right? Maybe he's a little sad, but then it's fine, goes back to playing, right? So they know, and, and then even when the, when the mother is there, you know, the securely attached child just plays, plays, plays. 
you know, every now and then goes back to mom, says, hi, mom, goes back, plays, 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 right? Because they know that the mother is there. They're secure in that, right? So they don't need to, to, to overdo it. So anyway, so I think that my students are securely attached <laughs> because they don't need to come back to me. They've got it in their bodies, right? But they like me. <laughs> and so they come back to talk to me about things from, from time to time. So, um, so anyway, does that, I hope that responds to your question. Yeah. 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 Would you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious pedagogically if you think that some paradigm, I don't mean to overly infantilize our, chil our children, our students, right? I just did it, right, yeah. Freudianly. Um, but that, that that kind of paradigm of attachment or, or avoidance would be a way to see or measure, um, and I'm being very careful not to suggest that we're doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but measure like how, how well we're, our students are in this, in this room. Yeah. Like that, is that we could leave the room and they could still carry on the class. Yes, right. right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think it's infantilizing our students because attachment never stops. I mean, we're always creating um, attachment relationships, I mean, as we go. And, and hopefully they're repairing any damage that's been <laughs> done along the way. And so I think it's appropriate that as teachers we want to try to create situations in which that kind of security can happen. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Um, I uh, volunteer in the juvenile detention facility. We do a writing club twice a month. I'm just wondering if you have any resources, if there's been any work done on mindfulness in working with kids in detention. Do you know of anything about that? Um, there's been a lot of work done on mindfulness in prisons. Um, I'm, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know of anything right off the top of my head. Um, if I come across it and you leave me your name. <laughs> we know each other. Okay. Well, yeah. I can let you know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what kind of writing do you do? Um, we've been doing, uh, we've been there for about a year, and we're doing creative writing uh -huh. um, twice a month, and then we've just been asked to help, like, do help with their academic writing. They just do online school, kind of credit retrieval, and their writing skills are anywhere from reading and writing from elementary school mm. up until, up, you know, high school. Mm -hmm. So... We're doing creative writing right now. Uh -huh. Read yeah, a short yeah. story last night and talked about it. Sometimes we do poetry. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, I mean, I think that in some ways, <clears throat> not academic writing, but <laughs> other kinds of writing, more creative and expressive kinds of writing, can also be forms of mindfulness. And um, I mean, there's a whole body of literature. Um, this is, I mean, it's not about mindfulness per se, but it's about psychology. Um, I don't know if you're, anybody's familiar with James Pennebaker's work. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's just expressive writing, writing about emotional turmoil, right? And you don't show it to anybody. <laughs> you just do it, right? I mean, I think that that's really kind of a form of mindfulness. I mean, it's enhancing our awareness of our emotions. Um, in my mindful writing class, I often have students, I will have students, um, just write down like what they're noticing, right? And so it's a, mind, it's a mindfulness practice, but they're doing it by writing instead of, you know, being quiet and bringing it up in their minds. I see. Uh-huh. So all the things that have meaning to them before they're... they're yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could they, like, write about it and then, like, tear it up and burn it? <laughs> or anything like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're um, almost out of time, but I want to ask one more really hard question. 
and I'll be the last one. If that's okay. <laughs> um, so you mentioned several times um, in the beginning and, the, and in the mid, part, mid parts of your um, talk uh, about um, the connection or associations you're, you're making with social justice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm curious what you, yeah. how you, it, I'll just ask the question. How is mindfulness as an educator, our, wor our work with each other or with, our, you know, with ourselves, how is that mindful work um, social justice work? Yeah. Or how could it be situated as such? Yeah. And how yeah. might it, and the bigger question I'm really thinking of is how do we make that be work that leads to or helps the other stuff that's mm -hmm. life and death, that's mm -hmm. people on the streets or mm -hmm. people being shot and killed for very, you know, superficial reasons. Mm -hmm. How do we, how does this work become that work? Yeah. Also? Yeah. Do you, yeah. I, mean, I, I know that's, like I said, it's an impossible it is. big question. It is an impossible question, but I can tell you what I'm thinking about. I don't, okay. I don't by any means have it all, I don't have it all worked out <laughs> and I don't have all the answers by any means, but it's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I, and so I just want to go back to the attachment thing. Um, because that's where we learn um, how to be with others, right? I mean, attachment is sort of this fundamental way in which we relate to others. Um, so I'm going to make kind of a bold claim, I guess, but I think that all of our social problems are the result of poor attachment. I mean, let's think about our president, for example. <laughs> Do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's an example of very poor attachment, right? I think that our social systems are kept in place because we are afraid, right? There's fear there. There's this sense of like, I have to protect myself against these people who I'm afraid of, right? And for whatever reason, because we can't see out of our own delusion. So I know that there's problems with um, the research on um, implicit bias because I know that there's this sense of like, oh, we think that the end of racism is just realizing that we all have implicit bias. No, <laughs> that isn't the end of racism. But I do think that it's, an import it's important work for people who are in privileged positions to recognize that they have bias because I feel like that that is a first step to realizing I, need, I have work to do. I have work to do. I have to, like, I can't just let, you know, be part of this system that's oppressing people. I'm part of it because <laughs> look at my mind. It's messed up, right? So let me do this work of, of, of reprogramming my mind. Mindfulness has actually shown, uh, as may be a good study or not, but there have been studies that show that mindfulness reduces implicit bias. I find that very inspiring. I feel like if we can do the work on ourselves, we can then be... I mean, we were having this conversation, right? Because there's the whole idea that, no, we have to force things to happen. Yes, we do have to force things to happen, but we also need enough people who are wanting to force the things to happen. And so I feel like mindfulness is part of that, right? It's part of realizing, oh, I'm fearful, and I like these structures that, like, help me to feel good about myself, right? I like that because I'm, I'm confused. I'm, I mean, truly, I'm not seeing clearly. I'm not seeing how things really are. And I feel like mindfulness is a step towards seeing things as they really are. And then getting on the bandwagon that the Buddha was on, right, of, hey, the noble ones are not the people, the class of people I was born in. The noble ones are all of us, right, who are seeking a just, equitable society. So that's how I'm thinking about it right now. I like that. Okay. Well, thank you very yeah. much. Um, thank you all very much for being here uh, and engaging. Um, and I appreciate uh, your attendance and look forward to seeing um, many of you next time in January, I believe, when Barry Crow will be here. Yay. But let's give a nice uh, <laughs> uh, warm uh, welcome to the